Hi, bonjour. Uh, this talk will be in English, um, so uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alexi. I work as a senior Postgres engineer at Adjust, and uh, I also am a Postgres contributor. I am based in Berlin, where I organize a local Postgres user group, and I've been working with Postgres for quite a long time. So what I'm going to talk today is how to avoid vendor lock-in using open source software and how to build your own database as a service. So this is two parts. One is Postgres and one is database as a service. And uh, you all know that Postgres is quite an awesome database. Uh, I used to work at Zalando for a very big German retailer for uh, more than five years, and we trusted Postgres for everything that we were doing there, from uh, orders to warehouses and so on. Uh, and we never had any issues with any reliability issues with Postgres. But uh, a software is reliable not when you don't have issues, but because it's reliable by design. And Postgres is exactly this uh, type of software. It's uh, reliable uh, by design. Every write that it, uh, uh, that it makes goes to the write ahead log, for instance, before going to disk. So you will never lose your committed transactions unless something catastrophic happens to your hardware. Uh, Postgres is also very, very extensible. You can build your, you can create your own indexes, you can create your own uh, write ahead uh, log records, you can build your own background processes in the database, and so on. Uh, it's very scalable and it's uh, quite performant. I've seen on multiple occasions when uh, different databases have been replaced by Postgres transparently to the users and the users did not notice. On my previous job, for instance, we replaced MongoDB with Postgres and JSONB and our customers, uh, local customers, just did not notice anything. So the team that was working with this uh, database continued to work as it was MongoDB. Uh, on my current job, we replaced Elasticsearch with a, a few petabytes of data with uh, multiple Postgres instances and it performs much, much faster than the original Elasticsearch. So Postgres tends to replace either data by other database systems because of that. Uh, one thing that I like about Postgres is it's open source, so there is no license cost. You can look at the source code, you can fix bugs or apply bug fixes without waiting for the new release. Uh, you can also extend it with new features or pay someone, for instance, some consulting companies to uh, extended these new features. Um, and what is also important, you don't have to pay for new servers or to pay by core as it happens with other, especially commercial databases. You can have as many servers as you like. And there is kind of a uh, pattern that I see from uh, people coming from the Oracle world is one huge database to rule them all. Where people put all the data for different applications, for different use cases, because they're used to the fact that having another database server is expensive. But it's uh, not so with Postgres. Having sorry. another database server is cheap. You can have as many servers as you like. And uh, what you can do is uh, run multiple of Postgres instances, one per application, and it will give you smaller databases, which is good because uh, it will uh, not tax your hardware, it will not require special hardware, it will make maintenance like running vacuum or backups much easier if you have a database of one gigabyte instead of a database of one petabyte. Um, and what it also gives you is a simpler security model. If you don't share multiple applications in the same database, you don't have to invent uh, very, very sophisticated schemas to uh, separate access to your database by schemas or by, uh, to separate access to your cluster by schemas or by databases. Uh, and with the current modern world of microservices, you can have one database per microservice and easily end up running hundreds of databases as, for instance, Zalando did. And this actually is quite a challenge. So when you have one database, it's easy. You have this database, you connect to it, and uh, that's it. What if you have uh, multiple, hundreds or thousands of database clusters? How do you manage it from the database perspective? So you can do this in an old-fashioned way uh, by connecting or writing some shell scripts to connect there, do whatever you like, do, do whatever tasks you need, like, uh, for instance, running manual vacuum, uh, looking at the logs, and so on, uh, monitoring. 
uh, it, will, it would work, but it would obviously not scale. If you have thousands of database clusters, you would probably have to find 50 database people, and finding Postgres people is really hard. Uh, so the other approach that I see quite often is to employ uh, Ansible or Rex or Puppet, uh, so-called automation tools that uh, help you because you have some scenarios that you need, like you connect to the data, you instruct Ansible to go to your database clusters and to change some parameters, for instance, so you don't have to do everything manually and you avoid the errors of uh, doing manual uh, stuff. Uh, however, this has some issues because this is still triggered by the DBAs. So it's still database people who are doing this. And ideally, in order to scale almost infinitely, you want to remove yourself as a database person uh, from the equation. You want the end users to do everything for you and you will just provide the infrastructure. And here we go to the last part, to the, data, to the, very, to the fully automated way, to the state of the art way, is basically database as a service. You have a software that helps end users manage databases, and it's end users who are performing all the tasks. So if they need to change the configuration, if they need to look at the logs, if they need to troubleshoot any performance issues, they are doing this by themselves. You are not part of this. You can consult them, but given the thousands of databases, there is no physical way for you to basically uh, solve those tasks by yourself. You give power to your users. This is basically a database as a service. And the uh, end user can initiate different tasks like creating database clusters, deleting database clusters, updating resources, like can I have more disk on this database, can I have uh, more CPU, or can I have uh, two replicas, three replicas instead of two. Um, and uh, some tasks are performed in the background by the service software. For instance, uh, management of resources. Where do we put this database cluster? On the server A or on the server B? Or how do we um, inform the monitoring that we have new servers coming? How do we inform the users where to connect the database discovery part? And uh, disaster recovery, what happens if our primary dies? Or what happens if the user drops a table at a certain point in time and then wants to roll back to the previous state of the database? This is something that you want your database as a service to be capable of. And given that I maybe persuaded some of you that database service is good, so how do I get it? How do I transition my state to the state where I am running databases in a database as a service world? Uh, well, for some users it doesn't make sense. If you have only one database, you can manage it by yourself. We are talking about hundreds of databases. Obviously you can pay someone. You can go to Amazon or Google or Microsoft or many other providers and pay them to do all the hard work for you. Uh, this is the easiest way, but it's also expensive and it will lock you into this provider because uh, those companies are usually making it harder for you to migrate from them. Those companies are also making it harder for consultants or for others to help you if, for instance, uh, Postgres has a bug and you want some, to pay someone to fix it right away, uh, you won't be able to do this on Amazon because Amazon does not give you access to the, to the underlying binaries. You only get the database side of the equation. Uh, and it might not have all the features that you get in the stock Postgres. You might not be able to use logical replication or you might not have all the super user uh, access permissions on uh, such systems. So obviously what you can also do is build it yourself and uh, that works. You can write your backend software, but it usually involves skills that are different from database skills because you have to write something like a scheduler, you have to write some abstraction layer on top of your existing infrastructure. It's also tied to your existing infrastructure, so if you move from physical servers in the data center to AWS, then you would have to rewrite your database as a service. And it's quite expensive as you have to employ a lot of people who will do this for you. So until recently there were only two ways of doing this, but currently with the power of open source and the power of the community, there, are, there exist some solutions that help you by abstracting your hard, uh, infrastructure and helping you to deploy your software on top of that. So embrace the open source, and here goes the next part is database as a service on Kubernetes. Um, what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is basically a set of open source components running on your infrastructure that helps you to 
uh, abstract and to manage your infrastructure and deploy container-based applications uh, in a scalable and a secure way. So basically, it's about containers and it's about infrastructure abstraction. It's just a set of services, so uh, it's a software that runs on one or more of your servers and it gives you an API that you can use to deploy your container-based applications. And container-based applications uh, are not necessarily uh, stateless applications. You can also, and I will show you how Solando does this, you can also deploy databases on Kubernetes and leverage the power of Kubernetes to help to, to keep it running and to, uh, to have it as a database as a service. Uh, so what Kubernetes provides you is basically a unified API which you can use whatever you run your soft software on. Uh, you may run it on uh, Google, on Amazon, or your physical hardware. From the Kubernetes standpoint, you are dealing with the same abstractions and you are uh, dealing with the same primitives and API calls or client-side software. doesn't matter. You can even migrate from one cloud provider to another without changing anything in your deployment or in your infrastructure code. Uh, it allows you to deploy your applications and deploy your infrastructure by declaring in a simple YAML manifests what you want to do as opposed to writing bash scripts that does things for you. So you say something like, I want to deploy this application of three instances with, the say, with this name and the Docker container that uh, contains the application source code and it actually does what you want. It gives you repeatable deployments. It's not a uh, property of Kubernetes, but it's a property of containers because in a Docker container you have all your dependencies uh, built in and uh, put together. So you never had an issue that your application uh, runs in a staging environment, but you try to compile it on a production server, there are no dependencies and it fails and your deployment fails and you have to retry. Uh, because it's a container that works the same on all uh, systems that uh, support this container provider, it works uh, quite transparently. How many of you actually have experience with Docker? <coughs> Docker, no, okay, Kubernetes? All right, so we are coming to this world where there is a container and you basically have your program with all your dependencies shipped in a container that you can run using Docker on any hardware and it works the same. Basically, it's a very, very uh, sophisticated packaging system. So instead of like doing apt get install and something, you just run the container that is built by someone else and you don't have to wait for the software to be installed. It's all there, you just run it and it runs and a sort of virtual machine, but it's not a full-scale virtual machine, so it uh, abstracts some things but shares some others, so it runs quite fast, almost as fast as a native system. And it has been introduced by Docker some time ago, but there was some development in Linux even before that. There were LXC containers that were long before Docker. So Kubernetes relies on Docker technology in order to run your applications and in order to provide repeatable deployments. And Kubernetes is also very extensible, so if you are not satisfied with existing abstractions, which I will talk uh, shortly about, you can build your own. So you can, for instance, describe what is Postgres. You can write your own software that knows how to manage Postgres, that knows how to, what, what are the properties of Postgres and what are the actions that, are, uh, that you can do with Postgres. So you can basically uh, build your, encapsulate the mind of your DBA in your software if you happen to write that software. So you can extend it in many different ways. And the good part about it, it's open source, so if uh, you want new features, you can also come to the community and talk about these new features, and the community is very vibrant and very receptive. So what the architecture of Kubernetes, as I said, it's a set of services running on uh, some machines, physical or virtual. So each, each Kubernetes cluster has a master, which is uh, controlling all the worker nodes. So the worker nodes is where the actual uh, work happens, where your application run, run at. And the master has an API server that serves all API requests. And etcd, it's a distributed and strongly consistent storage which stores all metadata about uh, which applications are running, where they're running, what kind of hardware do we have, and so on. And we have nodes that are like workers, which runs your software. And your software is running inside pods. Pod is a minimum 
uh, entity in uh, Kubernetes that runs multiple containers for a given application. So basically there is like a master slave architecture which you have master which controls anything and you have nodes which run all the software and each node runs a Docker daemon and there are Docker containers on that node. Uh, and internode networking connects those nodes together. So building blocks. We are going to build database as a service on top of Kubernetes and we need some building blocks for that. So there are pods, as I said, pod is an entity that groups multiple containers. Usually they relate to a single application. For instance, if you're running your database inside a pod, then you want your pod to have Postgres software inside it, and you probably want something like a logging solution that will ship logs of the container somewhere else. And you might also want some monitoring agent to be part of this uh, pod and something else. So you may have multiple containers, each running a distinct application that is part of your pod. Usually the main container is uh, called just a container and the uh, other containers that are helping your application are called sidecars. And pods usually have some volumes. Basically this is where your data reside. It doesn't have to reside on the container file system. You can just mount any external file system that is supported by Docker and it supports multiple of them and have your data running on a real disks instead of a Docker file system, which is not suitable for databases. Uh, and pods are scheduled to run on nodes, think about nodes as hosts, based on their requirements, based on their resource requirements. So pods is um, basically your servers, either physical or virtual. It could be EC2 instances, so it could be bare metal servers. Uh, nodes run multiple pods, one or more. The, each node provides certain resources like uh, CPU, uh, cycles or memory or uh, others and it basically figures out which uh, pods should run on this node based on those resources. So if your pods, if your database says I want 64 gigabytes of memory and you have a node that says I only have 32 gigabytes of memory, then this pod will not be scheduled on that node. On the other hand, if you have a node that says I have 768 gigabytes of memory, then this node ha can have multiple pods. So Kubernetes may decide, okay, I want this pod and this pod and this pod. I want to give it to this node because this node has enough resources to sustain them all. And there are some ways in Kubernetes to actually say this pod has to, has to run only on certain types of nodes or this pod has to occupy the whole node so it shouldn't share anything with it, like for databases, for high, uh, highly loaded databases, it's quite important. Um, so there are multiple ways of controlling this scheduling, but basically your databases are running in pods on nodes. Uh, one important part is metadata because uh, all resources in Kubernetes are described by certain key value pairs that are called labels. So you can label your pods with those labels saying that, okay, this pod has an application uh, called Postgres and a deployment and the environment that it is production and uh, something else like the name of this database is shop. And you can use those labels in order to query your pods from the applications. So for instance, you want to say, give me all pods that, that are belonging to release staging environment and Kubernetes can give it to you. So it's kind of a way of structuring metadata there. And the labels can be attached to most of the objects, not just pods, but nodes and services and so on. So it's a universal way of grouping different entities together using the matching labels. So services and endpoints are also quite important because you may have your databases running on the nodes, but the question is how do you connect to them from your client applications? Usually this is performed, this is, uh, you employ a load balancer for that. So this is kind of a uh, way of uh, implementing load balancers on top of Kubernetes, but it's more, uh, much more powerful because you don't, you, you don't have to use certain types of load balancers. Uh, you, you can have different ways of connecting to your uh, pods. Basically your service can be configured to say connect to pods with certain labels. Like uh, uh, this service forwards your requests to only pods belonging to the shop database on production. So therefore you can run multiple instances of your database and make the, uh, and use the service in order to connect to the right ones. Or you can say can this service <coughs> is designated to connect to replicas of my shop database 
and it will use labels to only go to replica nodes. And uh, services have the underlying abstraction of endpoint. <clears throat> this is where IP addresses reside. So each service encapsulates labels to find out where to connect. And it populates endpoints with actual addresses of the hosts where it uh, has to connect clients. <clears throat> so another abstraction is persistent volumes. You have pods, and in pods you have volumes. But those volumes usually only leave until the pod leaves. When the pod dies, those volumes also disappear. What you want for databases is not like that. For databases, you want something persistent that survives the pod restart. And this is exactly what persistent volumes give you. They give you an ability to <coughs> mount external volumes like EBS or NFS or Google Cloud, Google Cloud Storage <coughs> inside your pod and uh, data that is on those volumes will survive the pod deletion. So pod runs the software, but your persistent volumes actually runs the most valuable thing, your data. If the pod dies and the restarts again, your data is safe, your data is there, and usually these uh, external volumes are also quite performant. <coughs> those are managed by requests, uh, persistent volume claims. So uh, in Kubernetes world, you want to claim one gigabyte of data, and then Kubernetes finds among your storage classes <coughs> exact volume that it wants to give you because it manages resources for you. So it can also share one volume between different claims and it gives you the volume so you can run your database software on it. <coughs> and what ties it together are stateful sets. So we have pods, we have volumes, and what you want in production is, <coughs> say I want three instances of my database, they are running of three instances of volumes, so each pod has a volume mounted. And if the pod dies, what I want is to restart as fast as possible, get the same volume that has been attached to it before with the data directory, get the same IP address so that uh, it can be found by, for instance, other cluster nodes using this IP address, and start. So this essentially gives you this abstraction, and it's, uh, it's quite good for running stateful services because you can basically survive the failure of your pods without doing anything. Stateful set as a controller will start it for you. Um, another thing is custom resource definitions. In Kubernetes you can define custom resources, like not the pods, nodes, services, and so on are built-in resources, but for instance uh, you can say, I want to define a custom resource for Postgres. And this custom resource will have something like uh, the size of the database, the number of instances, the users that will be populated in this database, the database name, Postgres version, and maybe Postgres configuration as well. I want to write the YAML that I invented by myself, and I will write a controller, a special application, that will process this YAML and will create and update or delete my database clusters. So this is uh, encapsulated in an abstraction called custom resource definitions, CRDs, and Kubernetes supports it since, I think, version 1.7, so since a couple of years ago. Uh, there is also config maps in order to store these key values to store your configuration, like, for instance, Postgres configuration or configuration of your clusters. Uh, and there is secrets to store logins and passwords, which are usually more restrictive uh, rather than config maps, so not everyone can access it. And uh, they are quite convenient for storing logins and passwords. They're not encrypted, but because of ICOs, Kubernetes makes sure that only those who need to access those secrets will access them. So given those, all of those components, what Solanda implemented is the operator pattern. It's basically, uh, as I said, in CRDs, you can, uh, you can have your own resources for any in Postgres. And for that, you can write your own application that processes those resources and creates uh, and performs necessary actions. And those are called in Kubernetes world operators. So it essentially provides an API where you can connect and uh, give some API commands, like create cluster, or delete cluster, your typical database of service stuff, and your custom application will do this for you, encapsulating the knowledge of the DBA if you coded this knowledge in your application. Like, for instance, it may know how to downscale Postgres cluster without killing your primary node, because if you have a node, primary node on three replicas, and you say, I want to go from four nodes to two nodes, what you don't want is to terminate your master because that will also terminate application connections and it will, the application will see it. Instead, you want to see, say, I want to terminate two replicas and keep the master running. 
So this knowledge can be encapsulated in software that is written on Kubernetes. And Zalando actually wrote this type of software, Zalando Postgres Operator. It implements this custom controller, uh, watches the uh, operations with the instances of type Postgres. So we implemented special object of type Postgres that allows you to create and delete clusters, update cluster resources, or update the cluster configuration. So what happens is from the kubectl software, which is a typical command line uh, client for Kubernetes, you push manifests, YAML manifests to the Postgres operator with different commands like create, update, or delete. And this basically creates your database clusters on Kubernetes, updates your clusters, for instance, updating configuration or creating new replicas, or it can even delete your cluster. And uh, what, how it works uh, at the end is you push the manifest, the operator deploys this manifest by creating a stateful set. Uh, inside the stateful set there is a Docker image. It creates services and endpoints so that your application can connect to this uh, stateful set. Uh, it creates cluster secrets with the users and passwords that you specified in your manifest, which is also accessible to your application so your application can connect uh, with these users and passwords. It also creates those users on the new database. Uh, and it also gets some cluster-wide roles from special types of secrets called infrastructure roles. So for instance, you can have a single role to monitor all your clusters in Kubernetes with the same login and password. So your monitoring instantly is plugged in to your cluster. And uh, what it relies on, as I said, Kubernetes is working with containers. It relies on dockerized Postgres, so your Postgres runs in a Docker container, and uh, your volume is running outside of the container, but this container ships many extensions inside, for instance, uh, PG Bouncer or PG Repack. Uh, it also has some extensions from uh, Zalando. For instance, there are extensions to uh, have inbuilt Postgres monitoring via the background worker, or there is a PAM or OAuth extension to provide uh, PAM authentication by going to the OAuth endpoints, which is also developed by our developers at Zalando. Uh, it also compresses disk space, so your pods start faster. Everything, all the binaries are compressed and decompressed when the pod starts. It doesn't have to download big container. It's very small, it's I think 70 megabytes or something. And it employs automatic failover with Patroni, which I want to have a few words on. So it's a Python daemon that manages one of the Postgres instances, runs alongside Postgres, uh, it runs on the same instance because it needs access to the data directory and your multiple instances are deployed and using the cluster name in the Patroni configuration, they find each other and form a cluster where only one instance becomes a primary and all other instances are starting as replicas of those primary. Uh, so because it keeps this state in a distributed and consistent storage like etcd or console zookeeper or it can use a Kubernetes API, uh, what happens is that uh, you never had an issue, you have a an, uh, have an problem with having two masters, so-called split brain, uh, and uh, it automatically discovers all the cluster nodes via that uh, storage. So uh, the leader holds a special key in that consistent storage called the leader key, and the other non-leader nodes are observing that key and the leader updates this key periodically because this key has a TTL attached and it expires if it's, been, if it's not updated. So if the key expires, then other nodes step up and, uh, one, and each of those nodes uh, tries to assess its house and it tries to assess, go into all other nodes and asking those nodes whether they are far ahead in the wall position compared to this one. And if the node is healthy, multiple nodes can be healthy, they can be on the same role position, uh, they try to grab this leader lock from the etcd or from other storage. And if they are succeeded in grabbing this lock, they are becoming a primary and the other, and other nodes are following it as a secondary nodes. So we avoid a split brain by always uh, write the leader lock in etcd before promoting. And if we demote, we first demote and then delete the leader key. And if there, and each node asks all other nodes, and if it encounters the master, during, even if the leader key expires but the master is still running, then it will automatically uh, step down and do not try to promote itself. So we are going extra mile to make sure there are no split brain and there is at max one master at a time. So our goal is basically have one primary and only one primary. Uh, yeah, so this is basically what happens. We have etcd which stores state. We have 
different nodes that uh, one primary node updates the leader key, other nodes are just watching the leader key, and if the primary node dies, then the leader key is not updated, and after a certain time, it expires. So once the TTO goes to zero, it expires, and the expiration notification goes to all secondary nodes, and then those secondary nodes start to query each other using the HTTP API provided by Patroni. So they query and they go to each other and uh, find their role positions. And they also go to the former primary and well, find out there is a timeout, the former primary does not respond. So in our example, we have both nodes having the same primary, uh, same role position. So both of them try to acquire lock. And this is where you need a distributed consistent storage because if your storage is not consistent, then it could be that they are connecting to different etcd nodes and each of them acquires the lock and you have two masters. But this is not happening because etcd is strongly consistent. So once the first uh, node acquires the lock, another one fails and realizes that it has to follow the new primary. So this is what happens afterwards. The new primary promotes and the other one finds its uh, connection string via etcd and then follows it via streaming replication. So building on top of that, we have Kubernetes that runs uh, Postgres in a Docker container, which has Patroni that uh, realizes, that, that implements automatic failover. So this is a layer by layer built on open source software, which you can also use in order to build your own database as a service. And the operator can do multiple maintenance tasks. For instance, it can uh, uh, do configuration changes, also relying on Patroni. It can change resources on the cluster by, for instance, increasing the disk space online, or it can cope with Kubernetes cluster upgrade by minimizing the amount of uh, failovers. So ideally for each cluster you have only one failover when your primary goes from the old node to the new node during the update. And I'm very happy that all of this is open source, so you can go download the source code and play with it file bugs, uh, pull requests, and so on. We would be happy to hear your opinion on that. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>